Southern Ohio Farm Show. This is Gigi Neal of OSU Extension in Claremont County, Agricultural and Natural Resources Educator. Well, I'm James Morris, the Agricultural and Natural Resources and Community Development Educator for the Ohio State University Extension in Brown County. And I'm Brooke Beam, the Ohio State University Extension Educator for Agriculture, Natural Resources, and Community Development in Highland County. And we will be your hosts for the Southern Ohio Farm Show. Good morning, I'm Brooke Beam, and for today's episode of the Southern Ohio Farm Show, we can look forward to learning more about Ohio trees. We have an episode with Richard Purden, the new Agriculture, Natural Resources, and Community Development Educator in Adams County, and we'll also learn about corn harvest here in Ohio.
Hello, this is Richard Purdom with the OSU Extension for Adams County. I'm the Ag and Natural Resource Educator and Community Development Educator for Adams County, Ohio. And today I'm from the field out here. We're getting ready to sow some cover crops. And I wanna discuss a little bit today about cover crops and why you should consider sowing them this fall. So before we get started, we got the soybeans harvested um, here in October, the first week of October, and the ground conditions are pretty dry. The, the daily temperatures have been warm in the 70s with, with nighttime temperatures and the um, mid 50s or high 40s, which has allowed a lot of the soil moisture to be um, evaporated and soaked up. So the ground's pretty hard. Um, it's, it's pretty dry here in Adams County but um, it's still a good time to sow those cover crops and get some cover crop on the land. So before sowing any cover crops or doing any cover crop sowing, um, you can actually um, look on NRCS's website to look at the different seeding dates and seeding rates, um, their appendix, or go to your local soil and water and they should be able to give you a hard copy of those seeding rates and seeding dates for your area. But basically from October 5th is the Haitian fly date for winter wheat, and it's a good time to get that sowed. Today we're standing in a field that was chopped for silage and it was sowed into spelts. So the spelts have come up really nicely considering they have not had any rain on them since they have been sown. So some things to consider before deciding which cover crop to sow, there's many goals. Um, that farmers have in selling a cover crop, but make sure that your goal is something that's really needed on the farm. For my farm here, we're kind of level. It's It does have some slope, but erosion control is still an issue. So I sow cover crops for erosion control and building the soil and protecting the soil. Also compaction is an issue on my farm with heavier soils during a wet spring, um, tillage or um, planting um, conditions were wet, so compaction is more of my issue. So I am sowing rye today, cereal rye at that, so it has deep root systems that can actually um, go penetrate that hard pan that might have been caused by compaction from large equipment. So before you sow, think about how you're going to sow. Do you have equipment to sow? Or are you going to broadcast? on top of the ground? Are you gonna drill it? Or are you gonna use some sort of tillage tool such as a vertical tillage tool to do so? Today I'm using a no-till drill, which many farmers decide to use in today's agri-production because you put the seed right into the soil and it's right where it needs to be and you get faster germination that way where the moisture is. Making sure that your draw bar to your tractor is level with the drill is important because this makes sure that you're even depth throughout the whole um, profile of the drill. So making sure that your draw bar is level with your tractor is important. Making sure that your no-till colders are set um, at least a half an inch to an inch deeper than your double disc blades, which are these blades right here. So making sure that your no-till colder, no matter what kind of colder it is, which these are a deep wave colder, colder that has deep waves in it. So they will make more of a slice in the ground and a, a wider opening and do more of a tillage aspect for for the double disc blades to go through. But there's many other different options and no-till colders out there that you can use, such as the turbo till, um, the bubble fluted um, blades and many more. So, but make sure key is that runs about a half an inch to an inch deeper than your than your um, no-till or your double disc blades because we wanna make a, a prep, a seabed prep. So it wants to make a slice. So it makes a slice in front of the um, no-till quarters to get that seed into the soil. And when it's dry like this, that's, that's critical to make sure that seed gets into the furrow um, at least for small grains anywhere from a half inch to a quarter of an inch is where we need to be. For rye, we definitely wanna 
um, make sure that we don't plant it too deep because it's because it is a smaller seed and it can actually um, get too deep and have trouble germinating so another thing to think about is your seed source and also make sure that you read the seed tag properly so we have a seed tag here which it might be hard to see but we'll get her flipped over here so we're looking at this so the kind is right variety is not stated so most of our varieties are not stated but you can go with variety stated seed it is going to cost you more in the long run but most varieties are not stated in our cereal grain crops and our cover crops and it has our grade which not a big issue what we're really um, worried about is our pure seed we want to make sure that it's anywhere from 98 to 99 if it's 100 that'd be great but that's almost impossible to get this product comes from canada as you can see so keep in mind that even as clean as you think you might be getting seed there might be some extra stuff in there with it but the main thing is that we don't have any noxious weed seeds or other crop seeds and as you can see other crop seeds we are at a half a percent but the main thing is weed seeds so we're at zero 0.01 seeds and noxious weed seeds is zero as you can see that's very important when looking at that but the big thing is is our pure live seed so this is for instance if i want to sow 100 pounds to the acre of rye 98 pounds of this will actually come up so looking at a germination rate is um, critical in your pure seed. Our germination rate is 85%. So really out of that 100 pounds, we are 85 pounds will actually come up. So 85% of the 100 pounds that I sow. But I am not selling 100 pounds of rye because cereal rye is, like I said, a smaller seed. So our goal for cereal rye is most commonly um, for, if you're using it for haylage, uh, we want to be selling about 50 to 80 pounds to the acre. Um, if you're just selling it for cover, you probably don't need to go that heavy. Probably 20, 25 pounds to the acre is just fine. Um, ha so how do you know um, how much seed um, you actually got to germinate and if your germination rate was as good as what the tag said? So there's different ways of doing this. For winter wheat, a lot of um, studies show that we at least need to get 18 seeds per foot of row to get at least 80% um, stand and a good um, yielding crop. So, but to make sure to do this, so you look down once it's germinated like this to see, I just always use my foot, um, which can be done in different ways, but just put your foot beside a good stand that's actually grown up. it might be hard to see but you can actually count the number of plants in your foot of row just lay your foot down and count the number of plants or if you want to get a ruler that has you know you know measurements on it you can actually do that too but but just making sure that we get enough seed out there to cover the land is critical too because too light of a, a cover crop will actually suffer during winter and more likely to um, have winter loss if you have any questions about sun cover crops or or you know different kind of cover crops that you can sow there's many different kinds but here in october in southern ohio we're kind of limited to small grains such as spelts chitty kale winter wheat rye annual ryegrass cereal ryegrass that kind of cereal rye those kind of things can be sown um, barley not too many producers in this area so barley but um is definitely an option. So if you have any questions on that, you can always give me a call, 937-544-2339, and just ask for Richard, and I'll try and help you out with any, any questions that you have. Everybody have a great day, and enjoy this fall weather. Hello, and welcome to Jackson County, Ohio, home to one of Ohio's most rare and certainly most unusual tree species. This is big leaf magnolia or magnolia macrophylla. 
Um, magnolia macrophylla or big leaf magnolia occurs here in Jackson County in the Rock Run area, which is a disjunct population separate from the bigger populations that occur much further to the south. It occurs into Kentucky and Tennessee and down into Alabama and even into Mississippi where the bigger populations of this occur. But it's never a super common tree species anywhere within its range. Um, other than the size of this big leaf, which can be between 20 and 30 inches in length, and I didn't mention earlier, it is alternate, so the leaves do alternate sides of the twig. It also has these lobes, think of your ear lobes that occur at the base of the leaf, which will separate it from a cousin that occurs here in Jackson County as well, and that's umbrella magnolia. Umbrella magnolia has an acute base, which forms a nice tight or sharp angle and tapers towards the, the base of the leaf, where big leaf has these little lobes that occur. So it's one way to separate it from umbrella magnolia. Another ID characteristic for big leaf magnolia are these buds. They're very large. They can be three inches or so in length. They're kind of silvery, hairy, um, and just beautiful buds. And that's another difference between it and umbrella magnolia. Those buds are more greenish and they don't have the hairs that this one has. Um, what makes it really unique as well are the flowers. Um, the flowers of big leaf magnolia come in in late May to early June, and they're the largest flowers I've ever seen on the tree. They're about the size of a dinner plate. They can be about 12 inches in diameter. They're creamy white and absolutely beautiful. They kind of come in over a period of a few weeks, and then once they mature and the petals fall off, they're gonna form these cones that, like the other magnolias have, they'll be kind of a rosy color, it almost looks like a bunch of bananas, and then it'll produce these large seeds that it'll disperse. That They don't go very far, they fall right near the base of the tree, and when you find larger big leaf magnolias, you often find a population of smaller ones that occur right near it. Bark is a little bit tough to separate. It's fairly smooth, light color, but you will see bumps and warts that occur all over on the bark. Um, as a forester, probably one of the toughest questions I get is, what's your favorite tree? And I think having lived here in Jackson County for the last 20 years or so, I have to say that Big Leaf Magnolia is certainly in the running. Thanks, and take some time to spend part of your day in the woods. Thanks for tuning in for this week's Southern Ohio Farm Show. We look forward to seeing you next week for another all new Halloween themed episode. If you would like to participate in next week's episode, send us a picture of your pumpkin that you have carved this year. We will select the best pumpkins in the area to be featured in the Southern Ohio Farm Show from next week. Simply send your pumpkin pictures to beam.49 at osu.edu to be included in our contest. We look forward to seeing all of your creations and sharing them with everyone next week. We'll see you next week. Have a great week. Stay safe and healthy and have a bountiful harvest.